an important Python control structure to discuss is the for loop, which will execute a suite of code for each element in some kind of sequence that the for loop is passed. I will demonstrate this on my screen with the Python shell on the left by running the for underscore demo dot pi program on the right with the run menu run module command. So as we've seen with the range function in a previous video, it generates elements like from zero through four, if given a value, a single value like five. It'll start at zero and go up to, but not including that integer number. So executing a for loop with each element in that range, it'll print each element, in this case, followed by a space. And we can see that it went and printed out zero through four. And then this other print statement just causes the new line to occur for the next print that might be used. Rather than starting at zero, if you wanted to start at one, you could use two numbers, that starting number and the number that you want to go up to but not include. And again, this for loop will execute the block of code or suite of code that's indented underneath it for every element in that range. In this case, we can see it printed out elements one through five. As we've seen with the range function, you can give it three different parameters, a starting parameter, an up to but not including ending parameter, and a step parameter. So this one will start at five, go up to but not including minus one by stepping by minus one each time. And each time it will go print, countdown, and then the element. So we see it starts at five, goes to four, three, two, one, and it goes up to, but not including minus one by stopping at zero. So you could set up four loops to use different numerical indexes if you want by using the range function. The for loop is also good for being able to iterate over every element in some object. For example, if you have a string object, you could iterate over each character string inside of that string. In this case, we print out that character followed by a space. And once the for loop's done, we'll just print out a new line. So you can see for every character inside of string, it printed out that individual character. Essentially, each string in a string is an element inside that string. You could also iterate over tuples. You can see it printing out each of the tuple values, one, three, and five, or over a list of values like hey, hi, and whoa. If you have a dictionary object, as in this example called Greek, the for loop will iterate over each key like alpha, beta, or gamma. In this for loop, we use a conditional if to see if the key is equal to beta. If so, it will continue and go to the next element in that list of keys in this dictionary. The continue will generally cause the for loop to go to the next element. So instead of going down to print out the key and the dictionary's value for that key, it simply continues when the key is beta. Otherwise, if the key is not beta, it's going to be printing out what that key name is, and then the value in the dictionary Greek that's associated with that key. So here we can see it printed out gamma and the value associated with that three, and then alpha, and the value associated with that one. It never did print out beta because at that time it would continue past that element. 
Now, it might seem kind of strange that it was not starting with alpha and then doing beta and then gamma, but you may recall that the keys in a dictionary are not ordered generally. They do have something called a ordered dictionary, but this is just a basic dictionary where the keys are hashed into a random order. So it will print out all the keys and values, but not necessarily in the order in which you created the dictionary. We've seen the continue statement used in other loop structures like the while structure as well. Also, a supplemental statement for loops that we saw in the while structure was break. Break can also be used in for loops. It's not uncommon to have nesting of loops. In this case, in the final example, we see a outer for loop that starts at two, goes up to, but not including 10. So essentially values two through 10. And then another for loop for an inner or nested loop that will start at the value two and go up to, but not including what that outer value is. It does a modulo calculation, which is going to give you the remainder. If the remainder is non-zero, then that would be a true value. Not true is false. So it will not, if there is a false value, print out outer equals inner times the integer value of outer divided by inner. The reason for that is that would not be a true statement. Now, if outer modulo inner is zero, meaning there is no remainder, so then it must be true that outer equals inner times outer divided by inner. So not false is true, and then it will print out that true statement. Once you found a factor in this example, like four is equal to two times two, then it's not necessary to check to see if there's other possible factors there couldn't be. So there's no need to continue processing the inner loop and we could just simply break and end up going to the next outer value. What this loop does, as you might tell from the output, is find prime values. So the first time through, it was using two is the outer. It started the inner loop at two, but it would end at one. So it would actually never even execute this loop because a range starting at two, going up to, but not including two, would be at one. This loop would never execute. Once the loop either never executes or it executes for every element that it's provided, then it's out else clause can execute. So it'll execute two as a prime number. Likewise, if outer is the next value three, if we go with inner in the range two up to, but not including three, it'll at least start at two. It'll see if three modulo two has a remainder, which it would, so it does not break. Again, the for loop on the inside would be exhausted. It's iterated then over all the elements in that for loop. So its else clause would execute and then it would print out that three is prime. As we go through and we maybe find four for our outer value, now we'd go from two up to, but not including four. So we'd start at two and go to three. And neither two or three are factors of four. As it's going through the inner loop and it starts off with a value of two, 
for modulo 2 is 0. There is no remainder. 0 is a false value. Not false is true. So if true would cause it to print out that 4 equals 2 times 4 divided by 2. Or 2. And we see that there. It then breaks out of the loop. The else clause does not execute for that inner loop. And so then we go on and we'd work with five and so forth. So through this example, I hope you can see how to use a for loop to either go through a loop a certain number of times or start at and end at whatever values you may want, even by using stepping. Also how for loops are commonly used to iterate over or process basically each element that might be in some kind of sequence like a string, a tuple, a list. Or you could also consider the keys of a dictionary, a sequence that the for loop can iterate over. Like the other looping structure while, we also do see that you can either continue to go back to the top of that for loop right away, or you can use break to exit that for loop uh, before you're finished with processing all the elements of it.